it's not the tool, it's the carpenter. So uh, this is uh, the Children's Hospital uh, in Nashville, Tennessee at, at Vanderbilt University. I hope you'll all come visit me. So it's, it's an overwhelming task to try to cover what could be an entire three-day symposium on the topic of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So I tried to think about how to narrow this down to a less than one hour talk and decided that what we would try to cover this hour are definitions, epidemiology, and a little pathobiology of BPD. But to spend most of our time covering some controversial therapeutic modalities um, for either the prevention or treatment of BPD. And so we're going to talk about a couple of the most recently published studies on inhaled nitric oxide for um, BPD. Um, we are going to talk about oxygen therapy. You see a recurrent theme. It's one of my favorite talks. We'll cover very briefly caffeine and vitamin A and touch upon some uh, data or lack thereof for the use of diuretics and bronchodilators. So I don't have to tell this audience that BPD is a matter of great health significance. It's an important cause of morbidity and mortality. It's associated with prolonged and recurrent hospitalizations in our premature babies. And infants with BPD have higher rates of other serious complications of prematurity. In the United States alone, there are seven to 10,000 new cases each year and the prevalence of BPD has increased as more extremely low birth weight infants have survived. Long-term pulmonary follow-up, which is happening with more regularity now, suggests that there are lifelong alterations in lung functions in infants with the most severe forms of BPD, including small airway damage and hyperinflation noted out to eight to 10 years, evidence of increased uh, airway obstruction even out in adult life, Obviously, among some of our infants, a risk of pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonale. And it's important to note that lung function is normal in premature infants without BPD. I've been practicing neonatology for a, a long time. Um, and in the more than 25 years now, the face of BPD has changed. Large preterm infants that are born at weights greater than 1,200 grams in more than 30 weeks very seldom develop BPD. And there are many changes in, the pract in our practices over the last 20 years that might account for this changing demographic. Increasing use of antenatal steroids, early use of surfactant replacement therapy, and as, as we just heard, gentler ventilation strategies. But it remains the most common complication in infants less than one kilogram. It can occur even in those small infants who do not have significant lung disease soon after birth suggesting that the, the traditional tandem of oxygen toxicity and volume trauma may not be the major initiator in many of these infants. So this is a very old slide. Um, uh, Mario Rojas produced these data with Eduardo Bencolari many, many years ago. And there have been numerous publications since then that have really pr pretty, pretty much reproduced what's shown here. And this is the different clinical patterns that are seen in infants who ultimately, at 36 weeks corrected age, have an oxygen requirement and a diagnosis of BPD. So we have infants who start out pretty sick with a FiO2 that's fairly high, and they just remain sick throughout their hospital stay, and they have BPD at 36 weeks. And we have infants who are modestly ill, seem to respond nicely to our initial therapy, what we call the honeymoon phase, but then something happens out here at a week to two weeks, they get worse, and at 36 weeks, they don't look much different than these infants here. We even have infants who, are, who seem to have no lung disease initially. They're in room air for the majority of their first week of life. And then something happens. Is it infection? Is it some pre-programming um, that occurs in utero? Is it some, some second hit um, that results in a increasingly worse respiratory status and ultimately all these infants tend to look the same. And so I th think it is not so simple as to say that BPD is a disease of poor ventilatory management on our part. It is far more complex than that. And unfortunately, BPD has kind of gotten stuck in terms of how often we see it, although again, the types of babies with the diagnosis of BPD have changed. And this is despite many other changes in our practice. So this is a paper 
um, that was uh, published in 2005 from the NICHD neonatal network representing about 500 infants. And it covers the 15 years between 1990 and 2004. And I'll talk about what we've seen uh, since then. But you can see, at least in the NICHD network centers, there's been an improvement in the likelihood that um, infants will receive antenatal steroids through their mom before delivery over that 15 years. The rate of sepsis has declined, and in, in 2010, has declined further in the United States with the use of better hand hygiene and other things that we heard about from Rich uh, this morning. Um, yet despite these two factors, the rate of BPD has really not changed much at all. In 2010, the rate is a little bit lower than what you see on this slide, but I'm quite worried that some of that has to do with the changing definition, which we're going to talk about next. Note that the use of postnatal steroids has declined dramatically in the United States, and this may in fact have something to do with our failure to see a decrease in BPD, but we're not going to talk about steroids. So we have had a disease definition problem when it comes to BPD. So this condition was first described in 1967 by Northway as a disease secondary to RDS prematurity. And it was based on radiological, clinical, and pathological criteria. And Eduardo kind of refined this definition to make it a little more standardized in 1979, um, saying that it required an oxygen treatment at 28 days. Remember, back in the 70s, we were talking about much bigger, more mature preterm infants. In 1988, Shannon, um, coined the term neonatal chronic lung disease, and for a while this was the preferred term in the literature, and defined it as an oxygen requirement at 36 weeks corrected age, because this definition um, identified infants uh, um, born at less than 30 weeks gestation who are at greater risk for lung dysfunction beyond the first uh, year of life. And that definition has stuck with us for quite a long time. In 2001, the NIH um, pulled together a group of experts um, for a, a consensus conference, and they redefined uh, BPD in the following way. So this applied to infants at less than 32 weeks gestation, assessed at 36 weeks corrected age or discharge, whichever came first. It required oxygen and or positive pressure for 28 of the first 28 days. Um, that part of it doesn't always get applied exactly um, religiously. Plus, at 36 weeks, you had mild BPD if you were in oxygen for your first 28 weeks, but for first 28 days, but in room air at 36 weeks. Moderate BPD if you had a need for less than 30% oxygen at 36 weeks. And severe BPD if you needed more than 30% oxygen, CPAP or ventilation. So this slide was um, uh, borrowed from Michelle Walsh uh, in Cleveland, um, where Richard is. And it's the results of a study at the, in the NICHD network in which they applied a physiologic definition of BPD, where in this study, almost 1,600 very low birth weight infants were divided into three groups. Those who were on a ventilator, needed CPAP, or had an oxygen requirement greater than 30%. Uh, percent. There were 269 of these infants um, at 36 weeks. There were over 1,000 infants, almost 1,100 infants in room air at 36 weeks. And then there was this group of infants who were on less than 30% oxygen, or if they were um, on 30% oxygen or more, they had a saturation that was quite high, and there were 230 in this group. And they underwent an oxygen reduction test, or a room air challenge. And as you can see, 128 of these 230 infants failed their room air challenge, 102 passed. And so with that, this group that failed was defined as having BPD, about 400 infants. And this group, those that passed their room air challenge, or those that were in room air anyway, were defined as having no BPD, about 1,200. And when they applied this um, uh, physiologic definition of BPD to the entire neonatal network, all, all of the sites, virtually every site had a marked reduction in the frequency of BPD as defined clinically by just 
whatever that nursery's policy was for oxygen use at 36 weeks versus the physiologic challenge. Look at this site. Their uh, clinical definition gave them a BPD rate of 60%, and with a room air challenge, it was down to about 16%. Man, that's a great way to show that your practices have gotten better. You simply change the approach to the definition. And I, I show you this because I think this is a huge problem in neonatology. I mean, how crazy are we to define a disease by how we manage it or treat it? There's no other disease I think you could think of in the world which is defined by how, by how we treat it. And so I propose to you that it is this lack of a good definition of BPD that in some respects has resulted in so many failed clinical trials for prevention or treatment of BPD. So keep that in mind. So really to understand BPD, you have to understand normal lung development. And so we all know that there is a very rapid increase in um, alveolar septation and in vessel growth in the latter part of gestation. And so these, this rapid increase occurs in the saccular and alveolar stages of lung development. The saccular stage starting at about 24 weeks and continuing on to 36 weeks, and the alveolar stage starting at 36 weeks and continuing on to three years. And it is, of course, in this rapid phase of lung growth and development that our most premature babies at highest risk for BPD are born. And there are many opportunities for us to interfere with, or maybe it's simply the birth process, the long, normal lung growth that should occur had that infant remained in utero. Oops, wrong arrow, sorry. So preterm birth can interrupt normal lung alveolar and vascular growth, and this is now thought of as the um, pathobiology of the new type of BPD. So you can think about BPD as lung injury during a critical window of lung development, where there is impaired alveolarization resulting in a reduction in lung surface area and leading to abnormal gas exchange, and vascular dysplasia, remodeling, increased vasomotor tone, re reduced coupling between the capillary bed and the alveoli, and pulmonary hypertension. And remember that these abnormalities can persist into adulthood. So this cartoon is from Steve Abnon, and it's, it just illustrates, hypothetically, what might be happening in some of our infants with BPD, where around the time of birth and in the latter part of gestation, there's this huge increase in alveolar number. And although infants with BPD continue perhaps to grow long and septate, they may never achieve their normal complement of alveoli. It's a scary thought. So I think we can learn a lot um, if we think about some of the animal models that have been developed to study bronchopulmonary dysplasia. I talked about some of them yesterday when we talked about um, pulmonary hypertension. So there's a hyperoxia as well as a hypoxic model that results in a lung phenotype that resembles BPD. There's some lovely chronic ventilation models. Uh, and in all three of these models, the amount of ENOS protein or its function is reduced, suggesting that endothelial nitric oxide synthase is important in the regulation of both alveolar and vascular growth. And there's also a model of BPD um, caused by placing the ENOS knockout mouse, the null mouse, in a mild hypoxic environment. So I'll show you a little bit of these data just to familiarize you with the literature. So this was a lovely study done by uh, Dick Bland and Kurt Albertine in Utah, um, uh, in which they took premature lambs and ventilated them for three weeks. So you can imagine this is a lamb ICU. And they measured radial alveolar counts in these preterm lambs um, after three weeks of ventilation. And so here is the preterm lamb who has very low alveolar counts, sorry, in the absence of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide markedly improves uh, this, but not to the extent that these lambs would have had they been born at term. So these studies are done at the same um, corrected gestational age uh, in the um, control as well as the preterm inhaled nitric oxide or no nitric oxide group. <laughs> 
In this study by uh, the group in Colorado, can, um, and there are a couple of studies published early in the 90s, they showed that inhaled nitric oxide reduced pulmonary vascular resistance and lung neutrophil accumulation in ventilated preterm lambs. Um, this was a study in the premature baboons uh, in which inhaled nitric oxide was shown to increase the length of secondary crests, so improves alveolarization, and also improve postmortem pressure volume curves um, in the lungs of these baboons after sacrifice. And lastly, this is a study that was done in um, ENOS knockout mice who were treated with mild hypoxia. So again, the knockout mice who were raised in hypoxia have a simplified lung, and uh, this was improved um, after uh, treatment with inhaled nitric oxide. So the, the lungs of these mice are fairly normal um, until they're exposed to mild hypoxia and then recovered in room air. And again, inhaled nitric oxide was beneficial in improving their um, lung alveolar septation. And lastly, this is another model in which they used the VEGF inhibitor, the Sujin 5416 um, compound, which causes really dramatic pruning of the lung vasculature. And this is corrected when they take these animals who have received this VEGF inhibitor early on and treated them um, for the next several weeks with inhaled nitric oxide. So again, it suggests that nitric oxide might be beneficial for babies with BPD. So why have all of our clinical trials been such a mess, many of them negative, and giving us very inconsistent results? And I think there are a lot of reasons for them. One may be our definition of BPD, as I mentioned before. It's a very nonspecific diagnosis based on how we treat infants at 36 weeks. And I think if you think about our various nurseries, we all do different things with our, our oxygen approaches. And BPD has a much more complex pathogenesis in human infants than in these much more controlled situations in the animal lab. So we've got infants with um, exposure to prenatal and postnatal in infection and inflammation. We've got infants exposed to intermittent hypoxia and hyperoxia. We have evidence of free radical injury and oxidant stress in our infants. We have alterations in how we nourish our babies and some of our babies, we're going to talk much more about nutrition uh, later on in this conference, do not get optimal nutrition, to put it mildly. And there may be genetic factors in human infants that predispose them to developing BPD. And then there's us uh, and our very variable approach to the intervention and all of these studies that were published on inhaled nitric oxide to prevent or treat BPD had very different study designs, as I'm going to show you. So I don't have time in an hour to go through all of the studies, and there are quite a few that I have left out, but I took the last three largest studies, and we're going to go through them in some detail, because I think if you just read the abstract, you're going to miss the pearls that one can glean from reading um, the study in uh, more detail. So this is the Kinsella um, trial, a big multicenter study funded by uh, NHLBI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in the United States. There are a number of uh, centers that participated, including uh, the center at Vanderbilt. And the baseline uh, characteristics are shown here in this study that included almost 800 infants, 400 in each arm. And you can see that these babies were randomized early at about 30 hours of life on average in both groups. They were mostly inborn infants. Most of them received surfactant. They were not terribly sick. Their oxygenation index was less than six on average. And they very smartly got cranial ultrasounds prior to starting therapy, a difficult thing to accomplish. And you can see that before 30 hours of life, about six to seven percent of the babies in this study already had a grade three or four IVH before starting on therapy. The primary outcome was death or BPD, and this shows the results by treatment group. And overall, if you look at the total, it was a very high rate of death or BPD, about 70 some odd percent, 72 to 75 percent, with no difference between the two groups. They had a priori decided um, in advance to look at the results broken down by birth, by birth weight category in 250 gram increments. And you can see that among the largest infants, those that are more than 1,000 grams, 
The numbers are small, but the rate of BPD was cut about in half um, in the inhaled nitric oxide group compared to the control group, 39% versus 64%. This was statistically significant despite the small numbers, but overall, if you include the entire cohort, there was no difference in death or BPD. There was no difference in any group with regard to mortality. As you can see, about 20 to 25% of these babies died. And if you look at BPD by um, treatment group alone, so these are just among the survivors, again, in this larger group of babies, 1,000 to 1,250 grams, among survivors, inhaled nitric oxide reduced the likelihood of BPD by 50%, exactly, 30% versus 60%. But the numbers are incredibly small, so you need to take that with a grain of salt, and it seemed to have no effect on the population of babies we have much more concern about. The next study was the European study of inhaled nitric oxide for prevention of BPD in premature infants. Um, this is a study I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar with and perhaps many of you participated in, published most recently in The Lancet in 2010. So this was another large study of 800 inborn, so they excluded outborn babies, um, who were randomized to receive nitric oxide or placebo. The gestational age was 24 to 28 completed weeks, and these babies likewise were treated early. This is the earliest treatment, in fact, in less than 24 hours. Um, the nitric oxide dose was quite low, five parts per million, and the babies were treated at least for seven days and up to 21 days. The mean length of treatment was about 16 days. The illness severity among these infants was described as mild to moderate. Um, they did allow prolonged treatment using CPAP if the babies were extubated. The subgroup of infants that got treated for the full 21 days was 288 out of the 800 total. And um, they excluded infants if their FiO2 was greater than 0.5 two hours after surfactant. So the sickest babies were not included in this study, unlike Kinsella's trial. So this is probably impossible to see. Um, this is the uh, results from, from this trial. Because I knew it was going to be hard to see, I wrote out the relative points in larger text. I hope you can read that. So the major take-home message from this is that they had a very low rate of death or BPD relative to previous studies. Some of that may have been selection bias. They excluded outborn babies, transported babies, and babies with an FiO2 more than 0.5 after surfactant. But their primary outcome was no different. Alive without BPD was the same, about 65, 66% in both groups. There was no difference in BPD among the survivors, um, also no difference in IVH or PVL. And the overall survival was very high, 88%, and much higher than what was expected um, at the start of the study and, the, and uh, upon which their power analysis um, was based. Um, oops, let's go back for a second. Um, the, um, there were a, a number of other factors that, um, that were important. They looked at babies less than 26 weeks and greater than 26 weeks. Again, they showed no difference between those groups. So unlike Kinsella, there was no advantage to the larger uh, babies. So their conclusions were that the studies do not support the use of inhaled nitric oxide in all ventilated preterm infants in the first days of life for the prevention of BPD. And that was really consistent with the Kinsella results. So the last study I want to um, tell you is a little out of order chronologically, because it was published before the, um, the European study. But it's a very different study design and should not be lumped in with the other studies. And this was the no-CLD study, as it's referred to uh, by Roberta Ballard and colleagues. So this trial was very different in its design. It was also a good sized study with about 300 babies in each arm. But they enrolled infants later, not in the first 24 or 30 hours of life. Matter of fact, the mean age at enrollment was 16 days in both groups. And about 40% of the cohort was in, enrolled between day 7 and 14. So 60% of the cohort was were enrolled in the, in the following third week of life. And um, these infants were also not very ill, but were all still on mechanical ventilation 
at the time of enrollment, or CPAP. So this is the primary outcome by birth weight category. Um, and what you can see, um, their primary outcome was survival without chronic lung disease, the opposite of death or BPD, if you will. And among the entire cohort of infants, 500 to 1,250 grams, um, the survival without chronic lung disease was significantly better in the group treated with inhaled nitric oxide compared to placebo. If you just look at the smallest babies, 500 to 799 grams, the results were not statistically significant, but you can see the trend in the same direction. And likewise, in the smaller number of infants, 800 to 1,250 grams, similar trend, but obviously the number is too small for any significance there. But the entire cohort was significantly different. If you look at the primary outcome by age at entry, dividing those 40% of the cohort that were enrolled between day 7 and 14, and the 60% of the cohort that was enrolled between day 15 to 21, you see a very dramatic difference in the survival without BPD in the group treated with inhaled nitric oxide and enrolled in the second week of life. Uh, 112 infants here, 115 infants here, very statistically significant um, difference favoring the inhaled nitric oxide group. But there was absolutely no difference for those infants that were enrolled in the third week of life. So this therapy did not seem to benefit infants enrolled very late, seemed to be of some benefit for that group of infants enrolled between day 7 and 14. They went on to follow this cohort um, at one year, um, and this paper was published in 2008. Um, doing very careful uh, questionnaires and fo um, uh, of the families, um, and they found that throughout the first year of life after discharge from the NICU, the infants that received inhaled nitric oxide, and again, this is the entire cohort, were less likely to have received bronchodilator therapy, less likely to have received inhaled steroids, and much less likely to have received uh, systemic steroids. They also looked at diuretic use um, at one year of, of age and showed that that was less among the inhaled nitric oxide cohort. The use of any home oxygen and persistent need for oxygen at follow-up was less in the inhaled nitric oxide group. And so whatever benefit it may have had for this selective group of high-risk infants still requiring respiratory support between after day seven of life seemed to persist throughout the first year of life. And they also uh, looked at a variety of different ways of slicing and dicing the cohort, the white um, babies versus minority infants. By the way, in the original paper, there seemed to be uh, more benefit for non-Caucasian infants than for the Caucasian infants. But here, the bronchodilator uh, therapy was less in the inhaled nitric oxide group, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of when the babies were enrolled or their birth weight category. So the conclusions that the authors of this study made were that in ventilated preterm infants, inhaled nitric oxide started after day 7 and before day 21, increased survival without chronic lung disease at 36 weeks, shortened hospitalization, data I didn't show you, decreased the length of supplemental oxygen, and had no apparent short-term adverse effects. And they also concluded that therapy between day 7 and 14 may be more effective than later therapy. So why the very different results from the various studies that have been produced? And here I've included the Van Muir study that was also an early trial of extremely sick uh, babies with a very high oxygenation index. In the Van Muir study, the OI mean for that cohort was 17. So this was a much sicker group of babies. The Schreiber study. Um, at the Kinsella, the Ballard, and the European study. So what I've done here um, on this slide is uh, underlined is the, initial, is the initial dose of inhaled nitric oxide, 10 parts per million, 10 parts per million, 5 parts per million, the Ballard study, 20 parts per million, and the European study, 5 parts per million. And then you can see the, the length of time on average that the infants in each of these trials were treated. And again, higher dose, longer duration of therapy started later in the Ballard study. 
compared to certainly any of these trials. The European study, again, um, again, this is shown against gestational age, showing longer therapy at a lower dose. Oops. Oh, sorry. Can't see anything here. There we go. Okay, this is another way to look at the differences in study design, looking at timing, duration, and dose of inhaled nitric oxide. And I think this really demonstrates quite dramatically the differences between these trials. So here's the Schreiber study, start out at 10 part per million, but immediately drop to five parts per million for a short period of time. That trial, by the way, was, showed efficacy of inhaled nitric oxide. Um, the Van Muir's study, hot, you know, 10 parts per million, very short therapy. The Kinsella trial here, which was negative. The European trial here, which was negative. And the Ballard trial, which was positive, showing a stepwise decrease over a long period of time for infants at birth weights of average 26 weeks and those bigger babies of 28 weeks. So again, we seem never to replicate the same study design twice when we do our studies, and not surprisingly, we sometimes come up with different answers. So to try to pull all this together, I don't think we really know the answer yet. There is another study replicating more or less the Ballard study design that has just finished enrollment last week, or within the last two weeks, the last baby was enrolled, but the results have not been released yet. So I think what we can say is very early inhaled nitric oxide as a preventative strategy for BPD in all preterm infants is not supported by the literature. The Kinsella study and the European study, I think, pretty much eliminated our use of this drug in all infants at risk for BPD early on. It is possible that inhaled nitric oxide in the second week of life for selected infants may reduce the risk of BPD. But at this time, treatment with inhaled nitric oxide in premature infants to prevent BPD should only be used as part of a randomized control trial with informed parental consent, and I think also with um, very important long-term developmental and pulmonary follow-up. So we're going to switch gears now and talk a bit about oxygen therapy for BPD. And I think it's pretty clear that there are many adverse effects of hypoxia which include impaired growth of the infant, pulmonary hypertension, increased airway resistance, impaired alveolarization, and organ damage from repeated ischemia, reperfusion, and poor neurodevelopmental outcomes. But the optimal target for oxygen for infants to um, minimize lung disease, I think, is still not known. So the ASCII trial that was published now quite some time ago, 2003, compared high versus standard oxygen therapy for infants with established BPD. So these were infants less than 30 weeks at birth, randomized to what was then in that, in that cohort standard oxygen therapy of 91 to 94%, pretty narrow range, or a higher oxygen um, target of 95 to 98%. And they enrolled these infants when they hit 32 weeks corrected age, or postmenstrual age and assess them at 12 months. And this just shows you that, not surprisingly, with these very narrow ranges of oxygen saturation targets, there was a lot of overlap between the two groups. But the results from this trial suggested that there was no difference in the two randomized groups in growth or development. The high oxygen saturation group required based on clinical um, uh, assessment, oxygen therapy for a longer period of time, 35 weeks in the lower saturation group, 38 weeks in the uh, higher saturation group. There were no differences in steroid or diuretic use, no differences in days on ventilation or length of hospital stay, and no differences in retinopathy of prematurity or mortality. But I think probably everybody in this room is familiar with this recent publication, the end of May 2010, the support trial from the NICHD network, looking at target ranges of oxygen saturation in, in high-risk, extremely premature infants. This was a complicated study. The network is famous for complicated studies. It was a randomized trial with a two-by-two two factorial design that compared oxygen saturations of Remember the boost trial, this was different. 85 to 89 percent, again, they picked a really narrow range, but a lower range, compared to 91 to 95 percent. They also randomized 
children to CPAP versus ventilation, so very complicated. This slide should look familiar. I showed you a similar one for the BOOST uh, trial. Again, simply to reiterate that there was tremendous overlap between these two, two groups. There were lots of babies who had times of desaturation, but you can see that the oxygen saturation targets for the 85 to 89 um, and the 91 to 95 percent group were different, but had a lot of overlap. So these are the results from the support trial. And again, I typed up um, for ease of seeing the primary outcomes. So the composite primary outcome was ROP or death. This was not a BPD study. The primary reason for conducting this study was to see if these different O2 saturation targets would affect the rate of ROP. They found no difference uh, in the combined outcome of ROP or death. But among the survivors, severe retinopathy was much lower in the lower saturation group. 8.6% of the babies in the lower saturation target group had severe ROP versus almost 18% in the high saturation group. Statistically significant with the number needed to treat 11 infants to um, avoid ROP. But mortality was higher in the lower saturation group. And there was one additional death for every two cases of ROP prevented. Oxygen use at 36 weeks, which was a secondary outcome of this study, was lower significantly in the lower saturation group, 37 point, oop, I think it was six or nine <laughs> percent versus 46.7 percent. Um, and B, but BPD among survivors by the physiologic test of oxygen saturation at 36 weeks and the composite outcome of death or BPD at 36 weeks was not different between the treatment groups. So this study made everybody take a step back and pause, because I think up to the point when the support trial was published, practices had changed. People were definitely targeting a lower O2 saturation. Um, I think most nurseries used a wider range than what was defined in this randomized controlled trial. But people were feeling pretty comfortable about allowing their small babies to hang out with oxygen saturations in the 80s. And I think this study made everybody stop and, and think twice. So this is the um, Kaplan-Meier curve that was published with this study, showing uh, that infants, uh, the number of infants who survived over time. I, I think there's some things that were not really discussed in this trial. So the, um, the difference in mortality did not become significantly, statistically significant until they looked at mortality at um, hospital discharge. At 36 weeks, the trends were the same, but it was not statistically significant. But the randomization for these infants stopped much earlier, okay? So out here, beyond 36 weeks, these infants were no longer on their randomization to high or low oxygen saturation, and yet they continued to have a differential in their likelihood of survival. Um, and I put the, the numbers out there, death before discharge was about 20% versus 16% um, with a significant p-value. The number needed to harm 27. Death by 36 weeks was not statistically significant, but the trends were in that same direction. So what can we say about oxygen therapy for BPD? I think we still have a lot of work to do. The take home message, however, that I feel comfortable providing is that we need to avoid hypoxemia. And there was a follow up paper that Wally Carla published looking at desaturation episodes and the amount of time that babies spent with severe desaturation episodes and with bradycardia. And it was much greater in the low, very narrow range, lower saturation group. And I think we have to avoid hypoxia not just when the baby is at rest. We need to be watching our infants while they're awake and active, when they're asleep and when they're feeding, because these are all different situations um, that affect FRC and may affect when a baby is um, saturating well and when they're having desaturation episodes, which I suspect is not good for them. But the ideal O2 saturation target, I think, is still unknown 
and it's probably not one saturation target for every single baby, regardless of how young they were when they were born or what their gestational is during the time that they spend in our NICU. I think we probably will need a more refined approach to O2 saturation targets that depend both on gestational age, postnatal age, and their stage of developing BPD. So I think this quote applies. I've yet to see a problem, however complicated, that when you look at it just the right way, does not become more complicated. And I think that applies to the oxygen story. So let's turn to some therapies that we actually have a good evidence base for. And that's vitamin A and caffeine. But, you know, we neonatologists have always been searching for the holy grail. And small trials searching for a cure for BPD are, have indeed disappointed us. Given the, given the complexity of the disease, it's really unlikely that we're going to find one therapy with a very large treatment effect. But we have some that have shown small but significant reductions in the incidence of severity of BPD. And yet, we don't always use those, um, those therapies. So the CAP trial was already mentioned in this meeting earlier. This looked at the impact of caffeine uh, on neural development. That was the primary outcome in infants with birth weight 500 to 1,250 grams. And they showed that infants receiving caffeine had a lower incidence of neurodevelopmental impairment. And here, the CP rate was 4.4 versus 7.3%, and a lower incidence of cognitive delay. As a secondary outcome, they looked at chronic lung disease, or BPD, and found that it was 36% in the caffeine group compared to 47% of the placebo group, with a, a significant um, odds ratio and confidence intervals. So um, this was a, not the primary outcome of this trial, but certainly very enticing results. And the positive uh, airway pressure requirement um, was discontinued one week earlier in the infants who received caffeine than the infants who received placebo, perhaps that being the reason for the lower rate of BPD. And I think most people have had long experience with caffeine for apnea prematurity, and I suspect most of us are using it with much more comfort these days in our nursery. Vitamin A is another story. It is one of the few therapies to exert a positive impact on BPD. And given over the first four weeks of life, vitamin A supplements significantly increase survival without BPD compared to infants who do not receive vitamin A. The absolute reduction in death or BPD in John Tyson's uh, NICHD study was 7%. The number of infants you need to treat to prevent one case of BPD is somewhere between 14 and 15. And yet the neonatal community has been very slow to embrace these therapies with small treatment effects. So how many of you use vitamin A routinely in your nursery? We certainly do. My babies are on vitamin A till they go to kindergarten. But it's really not being used very much. And I don't really understand why. It is one of the few trials we have done as a community that has shown a positive effect. And yet, maybe it's the IM shots. I, I, I don't know what it is. But people have not embraced this therapy in the US or abroad. OK, diuretics. How many of you routinely use diuretics in your babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia? OK. So we know that <laughs> we know that BPD is associated with increased microvascular permeability, increased hydrostatic pressure, impaired lymphatic, lymphatic clearance, and fluid overload that we do. And diuretic therapy, particularly with furosemide, can induce a rapid improvement in lung compliance and airway resistance, and sometimes improve gas exchange, as Dick Bland showed us many, many years ago. But there are surprisingly few randomized control trials of the clinical safety or efficacy of diuretic therapy for BPD. There have been over 20 studies published over a 16-year period, but none of them recently, with varying outcome measures. Almost every single one of these studies focused on short-term physiologic measures, such as pulmonary mechanics. Only three studies extended any outcome beyond eight days, and none looked at long-term morbidity, 
such as bone mineral content or nephrocalcinosis, which are definitely known side effects of diuretic therapy. And so I think the summary for our, our literature in this area is that despite common use, evidence for efficacy or safety of diuretic therapy to treat BPD is completely lacking. The literature is replete with cases of toxicity, however, including nephrocalcinosis, bone demineralization, and reopening of the ductus arteriosus. This is a study in desperate need of being done. It does not require sophisticated ventilators, technology, just a little bit of hard work and some equipoise. And so no matter where you live, if you have BPD in your nursery, this is a study that you can do if you have equipoise. Randomize your babies to, to bronchodilate, to uh, diuretics, that's coming next, or no diuretics and inform the world about whether this is safe or efficacious therapy. We are using these drugs with known toxicity and no evidence that it makes any long-term difference for our infants. So my recommendations are as follows. I don't use diuretic therapy very much at all. I think there are no data to support the use of chronic diuretic therapy. You might consider its use for acute exasperations in, um, ex in moderate to severe BPD. And if you are going to use it, consider alternate day therapy to limit the side effects. And if you're going to use this drug, you need to monitor the kidneys for nephrocalcinosis. Believe me, if you look, you will find it. And think about thiazides and spironolactone for long-term use, which has less toxicity. But this study is in desperate need of happening. I've been pleading with someone to do it for ages. I can't do it in my nursery because we don't have equipoise. We don't think it works. We don't use very much diuretic therapy. But I think there are many places that um, could do this study. Bronchodilators. So there is evidence of increased airway resistance in BPD. Richard's here. It's his, his area of expertise. Theophylline, beta agonists, anticholinergics acutely reduce airway resistance in BPD. But there are a number of side effects here too. Tachycardia, hypertension, arrhythmias, irritability, increased oxygen consumption and poor growth, and some um, concerning um, papers suggesting they can cause myocardial hypertrophy. And they may be contraindicated in babies with airway abnormalities. If you look in the literature, you will find that there are no data showing long-term benefits of early use of bronchodilators to prevent BPD. Whether chronic use in infants with severe BPD who are ventilator dependent improves long-term outcome is also unknown. And I think we should limit our use of these drugs to treatments of acute episodes of airway obstruction in babies with established BPD. So I'm going to wrap this up with one of my favorite cartoons. Neonatal practices are replete with examples of commonly used therapies that are not supported by the evidence. We have this really high bar for therapies that are new or devices that are new and trying to enter into our practices. We make Drugs go through multiple randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis before we accept a new therapy as evidence-based. But we have a completely blind eye for our established practices. And so this cartoon says our standards are very high. We even have high double standards. And so I'll leave you with this quote. The use of hypothesis lies not in the display of ingenuity, but in the labor of verification. Thank you. side.